for me, Eddie Claypool has been, is kind of the OG DIY guy. If you go all the way back to like the late seventies and certainly like whenever you hit like 1980, I think when I had him on my podcast, it was the first year he did his first DIY elk hunt. He did it in blue jeans and like flannel shirts, went to Colorado. It was hunting elk and like froze his ass off essentially. You know, I was texting with Nathan, Nathan Killen um, yesterday or the day before and um, you know, Nathan's another another big woods guy, like Clint mentioned, um, hunts the greater Appalachia region, does it with traditional equipment. And Nathan is a guy that is really a, he's a woodsman. Number two, Jake Bush. Jake Bush is younger. Um, he's, his resume is growing, but I feel like Jake is year in and year out. The guy puts on more more miles on public ground than anybody I know. I mean, he moved to Ohio for whitetail deer. Johnny Stewart is one of those guys that when you talk to him, like you want to talk about different. You want to talk about like a guy that sees things differently that might be the closest human being to a whitetail deer on the planet. <laughs> like he just thinks of things as if he were a deer. Lights, camera. Follow the trail. Red is shoot. If you know where a deer's bedding and you know where he's eating, that deer should be dead. Camera. If you're passive on a deer, what you're doing is you're teaching. I've got 30 bucks in the Michigan record book. Everyone but one has had at least one previous wound on his body. Some had as many as four. <laughs> trail Cam Radio from the guys at Exodus. All right, everyone, we are live and we have a panel discussion for you guys today all about the top five deadliest bow hunters on the planet that you may never have heard of so we have a couple special guests today chad and i are obviously here and then we have clint campbell from the truth from the stand podcast and we have aaron how do you spell your last name <laughs> blicey blicey aaron yeah. blicey from the fall podcast so um, Clint, start with you, give yourself an introduction. And then when Clint finishes that introduction, Aaron, go ahead and start yours. Uh, Clint Campbell, Truth from the Stand podcast. Also, uh, partner deer dragger for Chad Sylvester. Take care of his, <laughs> take care of his heavyweight for him. Uh, multi-time, uh, offender on the, uh, on trail cam radio and, uh, of, uh, of the YouTube channel. So happy to be here. Looking forward to the chat. Yeah, definitely. My name is Aaron Blasey um, from the Fall Podcast. Started my podcast probably three and a half years ago. Uh, my day job as I'm a television producer, I get to travel the world and film hunts and edit, produce them. And honestly, the podcast is kind of a, re a release from, from that. I like to sit down and I'm a whitetail guy at heart. And uh, that's all I live and breathe. I don't care to go on any other hunt right now, but a whitetail hunt. So that's what I love to do. If you guys have heard um, the reason why we have these two here Aaron hosts a podcast Clint hosts a podcast and if you're listening to this podcast I know you've heard of these guys and they get the opportunity to talk to a ton of deer hunters some of the best in the world and that's why we chose these two guys to be our guests for this discussion um, we just did a pod or it wasn't a podcast it was a YouTube video it was a short video 11 minutes on who we think are the top five deadliest bow hunters that are famous that you've probably heard of. And our list was in order five to one. Five was Tony Peterson. Yeah. Check, take it. Uh, number five was Tony Peterson. Number four was John Eberhardt. Number three was Jared Scheffler. Number two was Zach Farenbaugh. And number one was Andy May. So we compiled that list here at the office uh, based on really five criteria points. One was these guys had to be able to kill anywhere in the country, get it done anywhere in multiple environments, multiple states. Um, two, they actually had to have the body of work to show that they were, you know, whitetail killers. So they couldn't just talk to talk, but they had to walk to walk. Um, third point was we wanted DIY guys. We wanted guys that were hunting public, knock on door permission. We didn't want to um, include guys that were on outfitted properties or leased properties. And not to say that there's anything wrong with that, but I think the majority of us know like figuring these things out, figuring deer out, figuring deer moving out, knowing where to set up to have an opportunity is the game. 
Um, you can put a, just about anybody that is a halfway decent shot in a tree stand and let them be the trigger man, but they're not really doing the work. Um, fourth point was 125 or better. You know, so we wanted to have some kind of measuring stick on the deer that these guys were killing. So we used Pope and Young. And then what was the fifth point? The fifth was just doing, being able to do it in multiple different terrains. Okay. So you had to be able to, you, you couldn't be a one trick pony. You couldn't be the guy that uh, just hunts farm ground and kills a bunch of big deer. You couldn't be the guy that just hunts hill country and kills a bunch of big deer. You had to be able to prove your skill set across the board because um, not a lot of guys maybe even get the opportunity to showcase their skills across the board, but the guys that can do it in hill country, farm ground, river bottoms, those are the true um, best of the best. Yeah. Um, I feel like I was almost the fall man for that, for, for that video because we got a lot of heat and probably hurt some feelings even within um, our circle with certain guys not making the list. But you look at a guy like, like Don Higgins, for example, kills giant deer really consistently. Um, absolutely great bow hunter, but he's only doing an ag ground. Um, just can't make the list. Guy like Dan Infall, probably, arguably, could be the best bow hunter on the planet, but when you looked at his body of work, he wasn't doing it in the multitude of states that some other people were doing it. And that's the reason why Dan didn't make the list. But there were, you know, there were some honorable mentions in there, but, you know, kind of condensing that into a 10, 11, 12 minute video, like you just can't talk about everything. So that was one of the reasons with this, with doing this piece of content around the unknown guys, we wanted to do it in a longer format, have a podcast discussion and not try to condense it in a 10, 11, 12 minute video, because in that time frame, you're just barely scratching the surface of what these guys are actually accomplishing. Sure. Let's, uh, what, what's your guys' opinion on that top five that we just did the f top five famous guys. Well, <clears throat> we kind of, we were talking offline about it a little bit and I know whenever, you know, Chad and I were talking, even, I guess it was the day you guys were dropping the video, Chad and I were just chatting or whatever. He was kind of letting me know the, the video you guys were putting out or whatever. And I mentioned right away, and I think I even put it in the comments on the video, but I was, my top five was exactly the, the same except for my number one. And I think I commented, I would move Zach Farrenbaugh out of the number two spot. I'm sure I'm going to catch a lot of heat for this. <laughs> the reason being is because I would have put Eddie Claypool at the top of that list. And the reason, the reason I would do that, basically everyone would have, you know, Zach would have moved out of number two and I would have put Andy number two and then the rest of the list would have remained the same. And the reason, you know, I think Zach's a killer and he would probably be number six on my list or number seven on my list or whatever the case is, you know, certainly like in that top 10 kind of realm. It's just the longevity of those other guys doing it just kind of surpasses the amount of time he's been kind of consistently, you know, killing deer in multiple different states and multiple different terrain. I think he has the potential to be as high as the, on the list as, as he would want to be essentially. But for me, Eddie Claypool has been, is kind of the OG DIY guy. If you go all the way back to like the late seventies and certainly like whenever you hit like 1980, I think when I had him on my podcast, it was the first year he did his first DIY elk hunt. He did it in blue jeans and like flannel shirts, went to Colorado and was hunting elk and like froze his ass off essentially. And you won't find a guy that's more hardcore than him. And he's just done it across multiple species for like 40 some odd years. You know, we're talking, he's got Boone and Crockett whitetails. He's got Boone and Crockett elk, pronghorn, mule deer, a wolf. Like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like when you're talking about bow hunting, you know, just whitetails, maybe you could knock him down. But when I think about just like the best DIY bow hunters in general, like that ability to do it across multiple species for me is kind of the, is kind of the kicker. Cause it's not just different terrain. It's kind of knowing how to hunt different animals, almost equating it to like a trapper. They always have a sense of like, how do you get after critters? Cause they understand like what critters want and need at different times in a bunch of different, you know, critters. That's kind of Eddie for me. So that's why he would have been my number one. Zach would have been six, if you will. And the rest of the list for me would have remained the same. Yeah. And you know, Zach is, I kind of agree with Clint. This is not a hate on Zach. I, I really like Zach. He is an animal. He's top 10, 100% for sure. Um, I don't know if I would have had number two, but he, he, I mean, he's probably even top five, to be honest with you. But um, I agree. And Eddie Claypool, uh, he is way ahead of my time. I really have not really even looked and even heard of really Eddie and, and what he's done. But when I was doing this, I kind of looked at just, you know, white tail guy specific, but who can, 
who can do it um, in a magnitude of different areas, uh, different locations, different terrains, stuff like that on a, on a white tail front. And honestly, um, it was hard. It was really tough to come up with this because I didn't want it to be redundant from your list. Like I've got guys that one might be a kicker might be like, okay, didn't why, you know, there, and I'll try to explain myself, but, um, you know, guys that, uh, I didn't, like I said, I didn't want to be redundant, but I also wanted to give them credit where I think it's due in my opinion, this is all opinion based. So, you know, it's not Bible by any means. So <laughs> hopefully we don't hurt anybody's feelings. Yeah. yeah well, let's, other, go I, was, ahead. I was just going to say the other kicker for me is whenever two of the guys that were on your top five list, look at Eddie Claypool is like the Mecca that for me was like the, the, like the other thing too, is like, I know how much respect Andy has for Eddie as far as like, you know, he's, I think he's been on a podcast where, you know, Andy has, has spoke with him directly, you know, about, you know, just his approach and his style. And then Tony Peterson, you know, again, is kind of one of the, those guys where he looks at Eddie is like, man, if you're talking about a bow hunter and you're just going to drop him off somewhere and something's got to get killed, he, that would be his number one choice. So whenever two of your top fives are kind of saying this guy is the guy or like they have him in their list, I'm going, okay, this, for me, this has to be the guy then. Yeah. That was probably an oversight on our end. Could have been. Yeah. So let's, anyway, let's dive into the underground guys. Um, we kind of um, based whitetail cribs, off of these guys, the underground killers of the world, and we're trying to shed some light on them because hunting deer and killing deer is hard, and the guys that are doing it um, all over the country just they pique our interest, and it's the um, end of the deer season here. People are stopping caring about deer, so we need something to talk about, and this seems like a great topic. So, uh, Clint, start us off with how you compiled your top five deadly bow hunters. Yes, I was using the criteria that you guys laid out, of course, you know, multiple places, you know, good, bu good bucks, consistency, all the stuff that, you know, kind of Chad laid out before. And we were talking about this again, before we started recording, like the hard part is, is when you truly get to underground guys, you really don't know them, you know, mm -hmm. and it's like the ones that we even probably will be on our list. We're going to miss guys. And I'm going to put that out there right now that we only are able to know guys to put on the unknown list. If we're able to know them. Right. So there's always some dude that's hunting in Buffalo plaid, you know, in the back country of Wisconsin or Minnesota or whatever that lives off the grid. That's killing giants every year in multiple places that nobody knows about. Right. He's, you know, he's kind of the unabomber of whitetail hunting. <laughs> that guy's probably not going to make the list. <laughs> you know what I mean? So I kind of provide that caveat that like, they still have to be known to a degree as far as like, we have to have, be able to have some information about them. Right. Yep. And so that, so I want to put that caveat out there. So I'll start with kind of my approach was just to kind of compile a list of guys. If I had to think about, I'm going to drop them off anywhere and they fit the criteria that Chad laid out, you know, who would just be a, a list of names that would first come to my mind. Right. And I came up with like roughly, roughly 10. And these are in no specific order, just how I kind of jotted them down at first. First was, you know, one guy that I thought of off the bat was Mike Perry. He's a Pennsylvania guy. Um, you know, he hunts Ohio, PA. I'm not sure what other states. I think he's made it out further to the Midwest. But I mean, when you talk about a dude that can just kill mature deer and he's doing it in a, in, in a state, his home state, that's tough. And he's, you know, whenever he does fill a tag, it's always on the most mature animal in, in the timber. And I've had the luxury of talking with him. He's just a super awesome, awesome bow hunter. Um, another guy's name that came to mind, you know, was Johnny Stewart, you know, and again, when we talk about not known versus known, you can make the argument he's somewhat known, but he doesn't have a platform. He's a regular hunter. He's just gracious enough with his time to spend time on podcasts like mine and, and yours to kind of, you know, share his, his knowledge. But Johnny's one of those guys where again, a PA guy killing Magnum bucks, um, killing magnum bucks in, in multiple states the other kicker i would add for johnny is like a lot of time man he's does he's doing it in late season too his business that he runs is a as a, a you know he runs heavy equipment and, and does like i don't want to say landscaping isn't the right word but he's grading like land and stuff like that to where he can't necessarily get out during prime time of, of hunting season that's like his end of his busy season so a lot of times he's kind of um he's kind of left to kind of hunt you know, a lot of times during, you know, either gun season or late season, you know, archery to kind of fill, to fill his tag. And he does it with consistency. This next guy was a new guy for me. And I just recently had him on the show. It's Paul Putera. Um, I learned to him uh, from a, from a, a couple of mutual friends of mine. 
he's a Jersey dude. He's killing, you know, four or five and sometimes six years old, six year old and six year olds in Jersey. And he's doing everywhere from mountains to swamps and everything in between. He hunts Pennsylvania mountain country as well. Um, and he's killing <laughs> four or five, the six year old, you know, bucks in, in, in Pennsylvania. He's doing it in New York and he's traveling to Ohio and some other places in the Midwest and he's getting it done with consistency. Um, so he's a guy that kind of newly popped up on my radar. Next one was Joe Rentmeester. You know, now I put this on here with the fact, because the fact that he's a killer, I think he almost kind of falls in the same camp as Dan, where it's like, it's a lot of swamp Wisconsin-y type of stuff. I know he travels, but I just don't know if he has the body of work across multiple states to kind of make the, make the top five, but he's certainly a killer. This next one, New York guy, Todd Mead. That, he's a guy that probably was well-known, like, you know, maybe years ago when he was more in the limelight for his archery shooting. Um, but when you talk about a killer man, he's doing it in the Adirondacks. He's been traveling, you know, I would say he's fits that similar mold as like a Tony Peterson and like an Eddie Claypool type guy where he's been traveling and DIY bow hunting for more years than I've been hunting. <laughs> we'll put it that way. And the wall that he has is, is, is the proof that he, you know, how successful he's been. The next one is another New York guy, Jesse Coots, you know, and he's a guy that I've, you know, listened to some stuff that, you know, podcasts that he's done. I've read some things that people have written about him had a chance to actually talk to him last night for a little bit and just his consistency and his ability to kind of kill across a wide range of, of, of areas from New York his home state, which is hard, Ohio, Kansas, Colorado. He's doing it on multiple species, you know, with consistency. So that was a thing that I looked at Jake Bush. I don't think much more needs to be said a uh, younger guy, but I mean, you drop him off anywhere and he seems to be filling tags, Nathan Killen. Virginia, you know, kind of un, uh, you know, uh, under the radar state in terms of like big deer. And that dude's doing it there. He's doing it in multiple states as well. Troy Pottinger, he's doing it maybe harshest conditions you can think of for a white toe hunter in Idaho where he's battling other apex predators like grizzly wolves and stuff like that. And he's hunting Montana, Washington, and then traveling to the Midwest, Kansas, Iowa, and filling tags there. And then this one, I wasn't sure if it was even going to be in the consideration criteria. And I'll, I'll have you guys kind of help me kind of figure that out. But Bobby Worthington was one that I put up, put on the list. You know, he's well known in terms of like probably more well known earlier in his career as he's he's getting a little older. But when you talk about a breadth of work you know, everywhere from Tennessee, you know, Virginia, West Virginia to the Midwest, I mean, the dude's wall is undeniable as far as the giants that he's killed in those in those areas. Um, but he might be a little too well known for this list. But whenever you talk to guys like Nathan Killen and and, and, you know, guys of that ilk, like that's a guy that they look to as like, that was kind of their sensei, you know, that was the guy who they kind of learned a lot from and, and, and helped kind of set them on the path that they're on. So that's my overall list. You know, I guess I'll, I'll stop there and see if anyone has any commentary and then, you know, I'll kind of give you my top five. I literally, I think you, I think you were looking at my list to be honest with you. <laughs> a lot of the guy, like, I don't even have to talk about them now. <laughs> no, a lot, a lot of those guys, when I did the whole process, like, majority of those guys were on that and it's really tried it, it was really hard for me to figure out like um where they do their work at you mm -hmm. know what I mean like I've got it and we'll get into it when I get in my list there's a guy that needs to be top five with his resume in the last 10 years he's killed over 30 bucks over 130 inches with a bow you know what I mean and it's like but it's his ground private ground you know, and he doesn't travel anywhere, but it's like, he's not really that, I mean, he's known, but he's not well-known, but like, it's just, he, I feel like if you put him anywhere, he knows big deer. Like he knows like a Jake Bush, he knows that stuff. It's just why leave deer when he's got deer kind of thing. You know, um, I think that was really hard for me is to decipher what they've done over the course of different States and different trains, stuff like that. And honestly, my list is is going to be somewhat known guys and and guys that have been on your list and we've all talked about and for good reason though too. Yeah. Yeah, I think across the board there's going to be some crossover between between the four of us um you know there's some guys uh on my list most of most of my list has already been named just in the same boat as same boat as you Aaron. There's a couple guys that no one's mentioned here. So I think um you know, I, which is good because if there's crossover there, that kind of maybe ultimately yeah. might just put them in that top five. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, we were going to work through everybody's, you know, kind of top five, their final list, and then come back at the end and collaborate 
to make that final list between the four of us. Um, so I think having that crossover is going to ultimately solidify these guys even kind of even more so. But agree to your point that it's really hard to kind of draw the line between known, well-known, this era, you know, the 90s era, the 80s era, the 70s era. It's really difficult to draw that line and say, okay, this guy's known, this guy's unknown. So it's all up to kind of personal opinion, interpretation, right. um, et cetera. And to your point, Aaron, like there's guys that are killing multiple bucks every year, multiple mature bucks every year that maybe don't have the opportunity to travel or they aren't traveling. And that kind of disqualifies them from our list because of the criteria. But we're not saying that guy's not a right. top five bow hunter in the country or he's not a great bow hunter. We just are building this criteria on because what is the number one challenge as a whitetail hunter? And that is to kill a mature buck on public ground. That's the biggest challenge in the country as a bow hunter. And I mean, there's some debate on whether or not like a piece of main private ground is harder than Iowa public. But I mean, there's, there's some, um, geography of like where you're doing it to. And mm -hmm. Clint mentioned before we started recording that part of his criteria was if your home state is hard to kill a deer, but you have that figured out, you are automatically put in a position where like, if you can do it in Pennsylvania, you can go to Kansas and Illinois and Iowa and probably do it. So 100%. I just wanted to make those points. And also I wanted to point out one thing with the name Mike Perry. This is Mike Perry from Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. There is a Mike Perry that is an absolute killer in Alabama. And he just killed the Alabama state record last year. And he has a resume that is like another, if the guy in the South is Mike Perry. So I just wanted to clear up that this is, hmm. we're talking about Mike Perry from New York or P Pennsylvania. Right. We want to get our Perry straight. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so I'm going to change my name here soon. <laughs> <laughs> um, so do you guys want me to just to go through, through my, my uh, top five now and we can yeah. kind of then, then move on. So let me ask you guys this though, before I, before I do that, like, do you feel, do we feel that Bobby Worthington is, is probably too well known? Like, cause he's had his, yeah. kind of heyday like he, he's written a good bit and and stuff like that that it probably isn't fair to put him on this list necessarily yeah i would i would agree with that i mean the guys published a book um i think most most upper echelon whitetail hunters know his name and i actually would probably throw joe rentmeister in there too just because of the association with dan and mm -hmm. and um you know the hunting beast hunting beast gear i feel mm -hmm. like he's another guy that um Again, it's been on cross multiple podcasts, YouTube. Um, I would put him probably in the in the in the known category personally. Okay. Oh, there's one more that I forgot to put on uh, that I just realized here. Travis Keith is another one that was on my list. He's uh, Oklahoma, Kansas. Um, he is a guy that Eddie Claypool actually turned me on to and said, you know, you want to talk about a younger guy that nobody knows a whole lot about that just kills nothing but big deer. He's like, this is this is the guy. Um, so that was, and so I had him on the show as well and got to know him. Um, and just, and he's a straight killer. Um, so I'll go through my top five. This is my top five in order. I've kind of given you the, the criteria or, or the, I guess their resume, if you will, briefly. Um, so my number one is, or actually you want me to go backwards for suspense. Oh, there you go. <laughs> Look at that. Look at that content creators. Here we are at work. Um, uh, my number five is Travis Keith. Um, I didn't mention a whole lot about him, but he comes uh, in, in high regard from Eddie Claypool. I had him on the show. Um, you know, he does most of his hunting in Oklahoma and Kansas, and it's all it's all public or or by permission. I'm not sure if he's traveled beyond beyond that to to be 100 percent honest with you. But after the podcast we did together, I asked him, said, "Hey, just show me, shoot me a couple pictures of some of some bucks or whatever, so I can use for a, a post and for the uh, uh, for the actual blog post." And the dude sent me like ten giants that he's killed. You know what I mean? So that was like. It was just a couple of them. And then this year alone, uh, he had some family stuff going on. He wasn't able to hunt a whole lot. I think he hunted a total of four hours uh, and killed a buck in Kansas and killed a, a hammer in Kansas and killed a hammer in Oklahoma. And he was had a total of like four hours in the tree. So when you talk about getting it done, you know, that dude's doing it on the regular and he's doing it pretty much every year. My number four is uh, Jesse Coots. Um, that for me was kind of an, an, a no brainer whenever I saw his body of work and just, Again, Cameron, going back to what you said, he's doing it in New York as his home state. 
you know, and he's doing it. There was a four or five year stretch that I was reading where he killed his target buck on opening day for like four to five years straight, which when you're doing that kind of stuff, you can then venture out to other States and try to go kill in other places. Cause you're filling tags early, you know, at home. So he was my number four. Um, my number three is Nathan Killen. Um, big woods that he's primarily doing it in, especially in his home state of Virginia. He's got some West Virginia. He's got some Ohio. I know he's been to some other States, but that dude is killing giants on the regular in places that are really hard to do it. And the other kicker is with him and he's doing it with traditional equipment. So it's not like he's able to take a 30 yard shot or whatever. Everything he's killing is up close and personal. And so he is my number three. My number two is Troy Pottinger. Um, you know, doing it across a bunch of different states that are really hard to hunt, like Idaho, where he's battling apex predators, Washington, you know, Montana, you might argue Montana isn't as terribly hard because the pressure is a lot less there, but he's also doing it on elk and things of that nature as well. And he's got Boone and Crockett, you know, he's got two Booners that I know of for sure to his name from, from Idaho. Um, and then when you just look at his wall that he has in terms of the amount of deer he's killed and the quality that he's killed and the places that he's killed them to me as a, as a, as, as getting put on this list at number two, it was kind of a no brainer. And my number one drum roll is Todd Mead. Um, and I picked Todd because where he's doing it at in his home state, again, it's hard to do. And he's primarily been doing it in the Adirondacks of New York, which if you know anything about the Adirondacks, you're talking like deer density of like some, you know, remote places in Maine, you know, so it's it, the Adirondacks are a legitimate wilderness area at, with low deer density. And he's killing good bucks in, in his home state. And then he's kind of one of the original, you know, if Eddie Claypool was the originator, you know, Todd Mead wasn't far behind in terms of kind of pioneering that DIY kind of spirit. Um, he's been traveling for years. He actually wrote a book about it that I, that I read. And it's a great book. Um, and that's been his passion for a lot of years is, 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 is that travel hunting. So he's been able to do it across, you know, the Midwest as well as his home state of New York on a consistent basis. So those are my top five unknown DIY quiet killers. Quiet killers, I like that. Um, you want me to go right into mine? I'm guessing. <laughs> so, same thing with Clint. Like it just, like I said, I mean, I I had a list of 15 guys that, you know, it's to narrow down to five was like crazy because the unknown, even the unknown guys that I have, to in my opinion, don't hold uh hold the same weight as like the top five like that are either there, you know what I mean? Like, I don't know how to put that. Like, you know, the top five that are there, Andy Mays one, you know what I mean? Like those guys, the guys that are kind of known, like, you know, but these guys, the guys that, uh, that you don't really know. Um, I have a couple that, uh, that Clint had, but I'm going to start with number five. His name's Brent Todd. Brent Todd is a Michigan guy. Nobody knows him, but me probably. <laughs> um, and for good reason. And, there's a theme, a theme here with these guys. They're humble giants. They're humble. They don't want to be in the limelight. They don't want to, you know, there's a reason they do the thing they do. Now, Brent is for the last 25 years, it doesn't matter what state you put him in. He's going to kill a Pope and young or bigger. It doesn't matter with a bow. Um, his Michigan resume is unbelievable. I want to say it's 12 to 15 bucks. If not more that I know of that are Pope and young or bigger. Um, and he hunts Kansas religiously, all public land as well. And he's just a giant killer. I've had him on the podcast. I know him personally um, a little bit. He just, he's that guy. He's, uh, he's unknown, very unknown. And he, I remember when he came on my podcast, he's like, nobody wants to listen to me. And I'm like, just wait, they will once they <laughs> learn about you, you know. Um, number four actually is Greg Litzinger. Greg Litzinger to me is a guy doing stuff in a state that you shouldn't be doing it in. Um, you know, New Jersey, salt marsh, stuff like that. Like, I feel like he, his wealth of knowledge, what he knows and what he does is, is, is crazy. Um, I've, you know, got to know Greg over the last couple of years and he just, I've learned so much from him that I've implemented here in Michigan that is killed deer you know um he just he's one of those guys that uh is very good at what he does he's efficient i think um number three nathan keelan just like clint said i don't really have to say much more he's he's doing really big things and um 
I don't know. He, he is, uh, I, I don't know what it is about him that attracts me other than like, he's doing things that I can't do. I feel like, like he just, I want to be like him in a way of like, I want to go out and try the things and, and I'm just scared to, I'm intimidated. I'll put it that way. <laughs> um, number two, Jake Bush, Jake Bush is younger. Um, he's, his resume is growing, but I feel like Jake is year in and year out. The guy puts on more, more miles on public ground than anybody I know. I mean, he moved to Ohio for whitetail deer. Like he, you know, he moved out of a state to go to a better state for deer and Jake, he's just for the last couple of years, he's just, I don't know. He just, it's not like if he's going to kill one, it's when, and it's usually a big one. Um, and then going out to Kansas this year and killing a good one out there was, was pretty crazy as well. Um, my number one is Troy Pottinger and Troy to me is I get chills thinking about it. I I've never talked to the guy. I'm intimidated by the guy. I want to have him on my podcast, but I feel like I'm going to like, <laughs> I don't know how to talk to him kind of thing. Um, Troy, I want to go hunt white tails in Idaho and in the mountains. Like he does so bad. And for him to do it on the level that he's done it for as long as he's done it, he's the OG. He's, and honestly, I didn't know about Troy until about earlier this year, probably. And I wish I would have known about him earlier, but to me, he's number one. Um, he gets it done in areas. Like I said, you shouldn't get it done like he does on the deer that, you know, he finds them. And you, if you were to say you were going to go to Idaho and, and shoot whitetails, I'd be like, why would I go there? You know <laughs> what I mean? And he, he, uh, he does it, man. He's, he's my number one for sure. I think the other thing about Troy is, um, like what people probably don't realize a whole lot when they see just like his body of work. So like the guy must have time to do it, but he's actually like a school teacher. Yeah. And he, and when I, when I had him on the show, we were chatting, he's like, I might have 10 days like during the course of the entire season to go kill. And so when you talk about efficiency, like he's literally, especially, you know, anyone who doesn't know, like his, his scrape and kind of primary scrape method that he uses, like he's literally setting a mousetrap and then he's waiting to kind of go capitalize on that mousetrap that he's set. And that's why he has the, you know, the mounts that he has, and he's able to do it in such short time. He's efficient. And that's what I looked into this, this list as well as efficiency. Um, I, I mentioned Brent Todd, he doesn't get to hunt a lot. Um, he's efficient and he's methodical. Those methodical surgical guys are like leaps and bounds above, you know, guys that like are bigger name guys. Um, this year, I tried to take that approach personally and it, I've had the best year of my life. I've sat 13 times this year and I've killed three bucks and it was just not overdoing it. I was always the guy that needed to be sitting every night, every morning and do it. And I blew out and, and hurt more than I could have. But that was one of the bigger things on this list for me is who does it methodically, um, surgically and consistently, I guess. Who were, uh, who are some guys that could have been, I guess, honorable mention or just didn't that were maybe in your list of 15, but didn't make the top five, but were maybe right there, six, seven, eight slot. Who are some of those guys, Aaron? So one, the one guy I talked about, and he's probably, he's for sure probably a little more well-known than these guys is Austin Chandler. Austin Chandler from Illinois. He has killed 30 bucks that I know of in the last 10 years, over 130 inches. And he kills giants. Um, and he only hunts November. Let's, because he's a farmer, he does not hunt October. I don't think he's ever killed a buck in October. So he's very surgical, methodical and what he does, but what kind of kicked him out of the top five for me with the criteria is because he only hunts Illinois, but I feel like he's the type of guy you put him anywhere. He's going to figure it out and he's going to, he's going to do it. And he does it with traditional gear and, you know, primitive or like, you know, compounds. He does both. You know, he's killed giants with, uh, a stick bow too, as well, or a recurve, whatever you want to call it. Um, he was one, uh, another one, Michigan guy, Nick Kohili. Uh, he is a Michigan killer. Um, he's killed a couple, he hasn't traveled very much, but he, it's, he kills, he tags out in Michigan on a good buck, 120, 125 or better, two bucks a year. It seems like every year. Um, he's young, he's younger than me. And he's traveled probably three or four different states, I think. And he's killed in those states as well. So I don't, I didn't think his resume really 
expanded where it needed to be, but he's definitely honorable, honorable mention on that list. Um, and honestly, Joe Rentmeester was on my list as well. Um, but like, like you said, Chad, I think he's a little well-known, like he's getting more well-known, but what he does is he goes against the grain for anybody that I know. He doesn't care if he wears a ball cap or a shirt or it doesn't matter what he's wearing, no scent control, no nothing. He's going to go do what he's got to do to kill a buck. And that's so cool to me. Like that is honestly, he would be in my top five um, just because he'll go sit over a bed all night in a tree stand and wait for that <laughs> buck to come back in. You know what I mean? Like that's yeah. flipping crazy. Like, yeah. so those are a couple of the guys that were like honorable mention, um, you know, that uh, definitely could be in the top five for sure. Yeah. That's the hardest thing I think with any of this is just trying to whittle it down to five, because regardless of the criteria that you're building the list around, there's so many, there's so many great whitetail hunters out there. And like to both of your guys' points, we only know a, a fraction. Yeah. We know a sm very small percentage of the guys that are even talked about. It's like, I don't know how many, Whitetail deer hunters are 13 million or something, something, I don't know, 33 million. I don't know. I have no idea what that number is, but we're talking about a compiled group, probably between the four of us of a thousand guys. Yeah. Maybe. I mean, so when you, when you think of the grand scheme of things, like there's, there's probably five guys like the Clint's point out there that are hands down the best whitetail bow hunters in the world. And we don't have a clue. Mm -hmm. yeah. I already know one that I'm going to get killed on was Greg Litzinger wasn't on my list. And that's oh, like you're, my, my best friend. Like, yeah. I, you're, I, love, you're, I love you, Greg. <laughs> you are, uh, you are up the Creek right there, buddy. Oh yeah. I'm going to have to text him after this and tell him, don't listen. <laughs> <laughs> I got, I got a quick question, Clint. What is, or I, I know we know your guys' list as far as the guys that are kind of known or well-known like Clint, what's your top five on the list or like, right off the bat, like the guys, like the Andy Mays, the, you know, the Jared Shefflers, like what's your top five right there? Uh, it's, it's actually exactly the same as what, uh, Chad and those guys had with the exception of, like I said, I would have, I would have moved Zach off the list and I would have put Eddie Claypool number one and I would have put, uh, Andy May. That's right. Two. Yep. Yep. You know, so that would have been, yeah. Otherwise I was, I thought the list was pretty prime other than taking heat for, of course, you know, the other thing you always have to take into consideration is that, you know, when folks have, uh, an affinity for somebody or they maybe know someone personally, or they've maybe had some conversations with somebody that person kind of vaults up on their list. I try yep. to be, you know, agnostic of feeling and emotion as far as like, if I'm just looking at the resume of what they do, you know what I mean? Where do they kind of stack up regardless of how well I know them or don't know them, you know, mm -hmm. and that's kind of how I try to look at it. Yep. For sure. Yeah. Well, I have, uh, I have six guys on my list and some of them, either either one of you have mentioned them, or maybe both of you have mentioned them. So um, I'll get into, you know, I'm not going to go over those guys super, super well, but I'll add some context to why I put them on the list, I guess. Um, and these are in no particular order. So um, one of the guys that uh, was mentioned was Jesse Coots. I was actually on the phone with Jesse and late to the podcast because I was, I was chatting, chatting him up um, this morning. And Jesse's a guy that I relatively did not, I knew the name, but knew nothing about him and only knew his name in context with other people. But talking with Andy May last week a little bit, um, he did name drop a couple guys that he felt like were unknown killers that he thought of in very high regard. So it goes back to, you know, to Clint's point, having two guys on a list that would put it saying, you know, this guy's the guy. Um, I think that part of that kind of catapults him for me um, onto my list. And he's a guy, again, with purpose, purposefully does not want to be known. Um, doesn't want to be you know, kind of drug into that limelight. It's a very, very humble guy. Um, blue collar, hardworking, like the whole um, come from nothing but success story. Like he's cut from that cloth. And when I was chatting with him this morning, you know, he gets it done in multiple states um, and in a multiple of tactics or strategies, which I think is a big deal. I mean, it's a big deal to go kill deer across 
um, you know, numerous, numerous environments, numerous habitats, but to be able to do it spot and stock, to be able to do it, um, you know, ground and pound, to be able to do it from a tree stand, to be able to do still hunting, like to be able to track deer. When you can kind of put all those things in your tool belt, like to me, you are the ultimate killer. Um, and again, he's not number one on my list and these are no particular order, but just having that ability with multiple tactics strategies, um, is a big deal for me. And beyond the big buck killing, I mean, guys killed a lot of big deer. Um, but at his roots, you know, the dude is a killer. I mean, he was killing deer out of necessity per se in his younger years as a, as a teenager. Um, and not until, you know, his late teens when he became obsessed with bigger deer because he was filling tags. And he's like, well, I don't have anything to do now. Now, now what, what do I do? So that's what kind of sparked him to venture out into new areas and kind of target specific deer. So Jesse's definitely a guy on my list. Um, again, I have Mike Perry, the, the Pennsylvania Mike Perry on my list as well. Uh, Mike's a guy that we've had on the podcast. We've done Whitetail Cribs with him. Um, he's a guy that's killed in three states, but he only hunts really three states, you know, Ohio, Pennsylvania, New York, all pressured stuff. Um, a lot of public land. He has hunted some, I guess, knock on door permission here in Ohio. Uh, so he has hunted some private stuff, but the vast majority of his body of work has come from, from public ground. And he's another guy He tracks deer in snow, shoots them in their bed. He, he can still hunt. Um, he, a lot of times focuses on, on bed hunting. He takes long terms approach where he'll go in and hunt the same stand for six days in a row um, in the big woods. So he's the type of guy that can really do anything he needs to do to kill a deer, um, which I think, again, is really important. And he's been doing it since the 80s. So the guy's been doing it for a, a, a long time. He's been doing it for 40 years. And he was doing it before, really before guys were really, you know, the industry was talking about this stuff. Um, so Mike, Mike is definitely on my list. Um, a guy that has not been mentioned that I've known for six or seven years. And if I were going to put this in order, he would be, he would be one or two for me. And that is a guy by the name of Jason Michael. Jason is a guy that I call the white tail gypsy. Okay. <laughs> the guy is in his mid to late forties. He doesn't work a normal job, but it's by choice. The dude basically makes what he has to make for the year. And I'm talking, you know, 20, 25, $30,000 a year is what his like annual income is not because he can't go make more money, but because he chooses a lifestyle that is dictated around traveling, hunting. Um, a lot of times he's living out of his truck camping, you know, truck camping. And the guy has killed 30 book bucks um, in seven States. Okay. Wow. Which, which is impressive. But when you look at some of these other guys like Jesse Coots, he's killed way more deer than that. Um, some of the guys that, that Aaron mentioned killed way more deer, has killed way more uh, bucks than that. However, one of, the Jason, one of the things Jason does for income is guides. He guides, you know, on some public stuff in different states, on some knock on door permission type stuff. So when you look at his resume and then going back to that criteria of us knowing, like figuring deer out, knowing what deer movement is, putting yourself or other people in a position to kill deer. If you were to include all the trigger men he has put in place on big bucks, that number probably, probably triples or quadruples. Um, which is like, when you think about that, having a 120, 150 opportunities at big deer on public ground, that becomes to me really, really impressive. Yeah. And, you know, being in the industry and all of us, um, you know, talking to so many different people and you see this on social too, guys are always saying, Oh, hunting's hunting's about big money, money. Now you can't kill, you can't go out and kill big deer unless you have money. It's all money driven. This is a guy that makes next to nothing. I mean, he's going out doing a job to get gas money to go to the next day to buy the next tag to kill another buck. Um, so to me, having that, I mean, the dude is just lit up with passion and he does it with turkeys. He, I don't know what the, his grand slam was. Uh, he did a single season world slam. 
Holy with, crap. With a bow. With a bow. And that was in like eight days. Yeah. Wow. So in 2015 or 2016, he killed four bucks, four bucks over 140 um, in 28 days. Three of those states and kills were done in six days. So think about that. And that's Ohio, Wisconsin, and Kansas. Clint, you and I just came back from Kansas. Like from Ohio to Kansas, that's a day travel. From yeah, from Ohio <laughs> to Wisconsin, you know, you're talking eight hours, 10 hours, or whatever the case is. So, like you think about that window and what he did in that short period of time. That's crazy, man. I, I totally I it's funny because I was trying to think of um I was trying to think of him last night and I kept coming up with the wrong name as I was trying to round out my list. And I couldn't come up with the, uh, I couldn't come up with the name. All I remembered was Gypsy, and I was like, uh. <laughs> <laughs> I could see his face because I always see him at Harrisburg, but I couldn't think of his, I couldn't I, think of his name to save my life. Yeah, the dude's in his late late forties. Um, you know, resides in Pennsylvania. Grew up hunting Pennsylvania. He can do it in the big woods. He does it in the swamps. He does it in the prairies. He does it in ag ground. Um, Pennsylvania, Ohio, Illinois, Kansas, Wisconsin, uh, Missouri. The dude's just straight up killer. Public land, 25 years running. Um, it's, his resume is incredible. And when you talk to him, you know he's a tick different. Like all these guys, yep. right? all these guys that we're talking about, when they are analyzing scenarios or looking at information, they they think differently. That's what makes them, that's what makes all these guys special. They analyze this information and they don't think like your normal whitetail hunter. Um, and you mentioned it, Aaron, with, uh, with Jake Bush, these guys analyze this information and they just, they process it different. They have different thoughts, different strategies, different tactics. Um, yeah. so I mean, even when I got to talk to Jason at, at Harrisburg, it's like, and you know, we talked for like a little while at the, at, at the Exodus booth and I started feeling like I was crazy, <laughs> yeah. you know what I mean? Cause I'm like, he's talking so far above me where I'm like, I don't even know what this guy is saying right now to me, you know? And the other thing is too, is like, you know, one thing I've also picked up on, I think in a similar vein, especially these guys that are just like straight killers, you know, and they, and they, and they do think differently when you chat with them, they almost feel you out a little bit. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like that's one thing I've kind of noticed and and they're not peppering you with questions. They're just kind of tagging along the conversation. They want to see, is this, is, does this person know, are they talking out their ass? You know what I mean? Type of type of thing. And once they realize it, like you maybe aren't on their level, then that's okay. But once they realize that you have a passion for it and you're a student of it, all of a sudden they start to get quiet and they start listening to you. Yeah. And that to me is like always like the telltale sign. It was the same thing whenever the first time I met Andre DeQuisto was the same way. It was like he was actually listening to me kind of talk about deer hunting. And he's, you could tell he was like intent on like, is there a nugget here that this guy's going to drop that I maybe have overlooked or need to go back to, you know? And so they're always on the, on the search for like the, the, the next thing that's going to help them, you know, fill their next tag. Sure. You know, and I, I want to add a little bit on that too. There's a trend here. There's a trend with all these guys. They come from states that are, I'm going to say lesser states, the PAs, the Michigans, the New Yorks, like not saying you can't get it done or you can't be the OG from a Kansas or an Iowa, but we're not talking about those guys. Like those, I'm sure there's guys out there that do it, but you know, the Andy Mays, the Jake Bushes, the Jasons you're talking about, the, you know, those guys, I think to further Chad's point about how Jason had nothing and comes from killing deer from a necessity, like, I think those guys were killing so many deer when they were younger and, and they had to learn it. You know what I mean? It was like, it, it was different back then. And they're, they're kind of older guys. I shouldn't say older, but forties. I mean, I'm only 34. You put 10 more years on me. I'd probably be a little more wiser, you know, so, but it's like, I'm just trying to say those guys are coming from States that I feel like you have to work a little more. You have to know a little bit more. You have to be more methodical. You have to, you're walking on eggshells in Michigan. When I walk on my front door here, I'm walking on eggshells when I'm going to the stand, you know, and it's like, they have to be methodical, which I think that's a trend. And with that being said, I think it almost makes them humble in a way to where they're learning it on the fly. They're learning it themselves and they're not gloating and there's no reason to gloat. They're kind of older school guys, you know? Yeah. You know, um, before I get back to my list and make one more kind of, kind of point or, uh, 
something to add context to what you just said, Aaron, about being humble. Cameron made a post about this uh, piece of content on Facebook, and you have all these guys that were tagged, you know, kind of like shooting their shooting their resume in or, you know, kill pictures or whatever. And it's like, there's nothing wrong with that. I don't want anyone to take this the wrong way. But I, there is something about being humble. And again, going back to Clint's point about when you have these conversations with guys and they kind of feel you out before they give you, they give you their time. Um, like, I think a lot of these guys on the list are Nathan Killen. I'm going to mention some, some things about him because he's on my list, but he's a guy, another guy that I've known for six or seven years. And one of the most outstanding individuals that I, that I personally know of um, the guy is super, super humble. And when you talk to him and kind of put him in this category, he almost feels like it's, he feels uneasy about it. Like he doesn't mm -hmm. deserve it. Um, which to me furthers, you know, furthers his, his resume by being, being that humble. But Andy Nathan, May is the same way. Yeah, <laughs> You talk yeah. to Andy and he's like, I, I, I don't deserve to be here there's five other guys I'll, I'll rattle off. And it's like, no, you're, you're, you're the Mount Rushmore. <laughs> well, it's cause the, those guys recognize that they're, <clears throat> that there's a lineage, right? Mm -hmm. Like they weren't the first to do it, you know? And that's when, when you see these guys, they always have a path by which they learned and where they kind of picked up their tricks of the trade. Right. And they've adapted them to become their own and become their own animal to a degree, but they're always paying homage back to like where they got it. And the other part of it too is, is that, the other thing you kind of notice with a lot of these guys is that they're willing to give you their time because they almost feel like it's part of their, their duty to kind of help those who have that passion, who have that desire to want to get better, to help pass that kind of that stuff along that's helped them. Right. And so it's very much like a, you know, when you get those like little circles, you know, that I think that we're all kind of call ourselves fortunate enough to kind of be in with, with some guys like this, it's humbling for us to kind of be in, I don't want to say in the presence because that's not the right way to say it because they would hate hate saying that. But like to have that group that we can draw on, you know, information from, and that they trust us and or, trust us to kind of continue that path as as we learn from them that we're willing to kind of impart on others who are you know equally as interested and have a passion to kind of want to excel at it. So you know, I think it's just a it's a very much a, um, a a community and like a culture of this kind of group that DIY kind of culture. I think is maybe a, a good way to put it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, I was texting with Nathan, Nathan Killen, um, yesterday or the day before. And, um, you know, Nathan's another, another big woods guy, like Clint mentioned, um, hunts the greater Appalachia region, does it with traditional equipment. And Nathan is a guy that is really a, he's a woodsman. I mean, when you talk to Nathan, it's, it's all about scouting. It's all about finding fresh sign. Like a lot of these guys do, it's very calculated. There's nothing by chance. There's nothing by risk. It's uh, I think Aaron, you used the word surgical. Everything with them is very calculated and very surgical. And again, to Clint's point, like he's doing it close range. Like he's not shooting deer at 40 yards with a trad bow, but um, just to give him, when I was texting with him yesterday, um, again, humbly saying, he has lost count of how many deer he's or how many bucks he's killed in that 120 range. Um, he has a two bucks at 130, one at 131, one at 136, one at 138, 140, 141, 146, 160, 184. Like the list just goes on and on and on and on, not counting those um, those book bucks that are just barely making it or, or barely under. So Nathan is 100% on my list. Um, there's a couple other guys I have on my list that I'm going to let Cameron talk about because there's some crossover there. Um, so again, a lot of crossover on my list, but probably much deserved crossover with the addition of, uh, of Jason Michael. Yeah. Jason is, Jason's a guy that because you talked to him, like Jason would have been on my list if I didn't have, like if you didn't already take him. So I tried to take um, an approach that I knew Jesse Coots was going to be on the list. I knew Mike Perry was going to be on the list. I knew Jason Michael was going to be on the list. So I tried to take an approach that um, these might be some guys that nobody has mentioned, and you you know one of them. And then um, I've also had the luxury of doing the series Whitetail Cribs, and I will go out on a limb and say I've seen 
more big deer in the last two years than anyone in the country. And I've talked to more like killers and there's some guys that are going to be on my list. There's two people, three people on this list have been on whitetail cribs. And um, the first one I'm going to talk about actually doesn't meet the criteria. He is one, he's a young guy and he's only been bow hunting for, I uh, killed his first deer when he was 22 years old and he's 31. And his name is Tyrell Roy and he lives in Oklahoma. And like I said, he doesn't exactly meet the criteria because he lives in Oklahoma and he's only doing this in Kansas and Oklahoma. So he's not doing it across a wide range of uh, terrains, but just listen to this. This is a text from Tyrell. I'm 31 years old, started bow hunting when I was 18, killed my first buck with a bow at 20. My second buck was at 22. My third buck with a bow was 24, is in the mid 140s. In the fall of 2000, since the fall of 2014, I've killed 15 bucks over 140, a couple of those in the 160s, one in the 170s. Since 2014, 15 bucks over 140. Now, like I said, he's not doing that in five different states. It's at Oklahoma is a two buck state, but when you walk into, we've done over 110 white tail cribs episodes. And when you walk into his garage, you just, your draw just drops. He does one shoulder mount in his room. Everything else is Euro mounts. And the kid, he's 31 years old and he's just an absolute killer. So Tyrell is at number five on my list. Number four on my list is I have, Another previous Whitetail Cribs guest, a guy that Clint mentioned, and that's Johnny Stewart. Johnny Stewart is one of those guys that when you talk to him, like you want to talk about different. You want to talk about like a guy that sees things differently that might be the closest human being to a whitetail deer on the planet. <laughs> like he just thinks of things as if he were a deer. And I actually had the luxury to hunt with him this rifle season. And I didn't want to talk. I just wanted to sit down and listen to everything he said. And Johnny, I also asked him for kind of like a resume. And he was on White Tail Cribs as well. So if you want to see any of these deer. But by the age of 26, you guys talk about people hunting out of necessity. And um, when you're younger, you're just out there filling tags. By the age of 26... Johnny had killed over a hundred deer with a bow by 26. That's so, insane, like, man. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely crazy. Um, he's hunted in eight States. I think he said when he turned 24, he started strictly hunting only public ground and has killed 35 book bucks since that time. So Johnny Stewart firmly on my list at number four, uh, I'm going to stop you real quick. It, it goes to show like these guys that we don't know. I mean, we've heard of Johnny Stewart, but, and you guys know him, but that takes like, this is not a jab at anybody, but like the John Eberhardt's that has how many book bucks. And it's like, John Eberhardt is up here. Like he's up here, you know, and this Johnny Stewart guy is like, He's right there, if not maybe a little bit more than that. That's crazy to me. And that's I'm glad 30, we're doing this because this is unbelievable. And, and he's 30 years younger. That, that's all <laughs> you know. What I mean? It's like you know, just like and again, not to take a jab, but like when you think about book bucks versus book bucks, right? And age wise, it's like you know, it's 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 insane. I think there's some there's a I think that would be a whole podcast unto itself, oh, like the yeah. discrepancy between like book bucks and like age, right? Like in time, you were the period time period in which you did it in. I think that would be an interesting kind of topic too, but sorry, Cameron, yeah, go ahead. Because what is a book buck in Michigan? I think is 105 inches. I think it has to be a, a book buck. I don't know in any other state it has to, you know, but it's like, I agree, Clint, that needs to be a, a podcast where it's like, let's start, let's start getting all this out there. Let's get all these people on and talk to them. So number three is a guy that I was hoping that you guys could have helped me out with, but we talked off air a little bit. And no one kind of seems to have firm numbers on this guy, but he is where he's at on my list because Andy May says this is the guy. And again, we keep talking about like when other people look at someone and they say he's it, 
and Andy May is number one in the world, then like, okay, this guy needs to be talked about. And this is a guy from Missouri. His name's Justin Wright. Um, the When we were trying to compile this, we were saying that there's going to be a lot of guys that get left off the list because you can't find anything about them. There's people that their names have been mentioned in forums or you've talked to people, but you just can't figure out anything about them. And we have a criteria that we're trying to meet and like putting these guys on this list. But because of what Andy says about Justin, Justin's on my list at number three. I hope maybe a listener can give us more about what, Justin has been able to accomplish, but he's from Missouri. He's from the South. Um, When we did that top five known people, everyone that commented was like, I bet this guy can't do it in the South. I bet this guy can't come down to Louisiana and do it. And Justin Wright's from the South. He's killing giant deer in the South. So I have him at number three on my list. Um, Number two is a guy that um, is – really close to uh, the circle here at Exodus. He's a guy we've done a lot of content with and he was the first ever filmed production of Whitetail Cribs was with this man and his name's Scott Buckley. And Scott has two homes. Like he has a camp home and he has his home and they are both full of deer shoulder mounts. He has to have two places to keep these deer And I had um, everyone that I put on my list, I wanted to add some context as to why I put them on. So I got some numbers broken down from Scott. Scott's from Michigan. And like you talked about with Jake Bush, Scott moved his family and his business to Iowa to hunt deer. His life revolves around whitetails. Scott has killed over 200 deer with a bow. He's killed deer in six states. He has six bucks in the 170s, five bucks in the 160s, four bucks in the 150s, six bucks over 140. I mean, it doesn't get any better than that. Mike, you Mike, know what I Mike mean? drop on that. I was going to say. Yeah. I mean, the funny thing is I'm sitting here thinking two homes to hold all of his mounts. I would need two wives because I'd need to be divorced to do that. <laughs> yep. You know, when you said move my, move his family and business, I'd been like that. The annulment papers would have been, uh, or divorce papers would have been definitely filed. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's like, yes. I would be slipping, I'd be slipping a wedding band on one of those antlers is what would happen. <laughs> yeah. Scott, the guy that he's done it in uh, Kansas, Ontario, Nebraska, Ohio, Michigan and Iowa and um, Scott's resume like when we first started talking to him was just absolutely unbelievable the one year he killed three booners one in one season he killed three boon and crocodile deer now that like I said that's in Iowa and it is different but how I mean three boon boon and crocodile whitetails in one season is just absolutely insane. I don't care where you're doing that. Yeah. yeah I, it's, I mean, that kind of animal doesn't, I don't care where you're at. I mean, I spent two weeks in Iowa hunting. I saw one. Yeah. I mean, like when I say I saw one, like it wasn't like I was in bow range to kill that deer. It's like, I, but I saw it. Right. Yep. And we saw one in Kansas over the course of two weeks, two of us between two of us, we saw one. Right. So and it's he like, did, he did two of those on public ground and one was on his own farm. Oh my gosh. Yeah. That's crazy, man. So Scott, firmly on my list at number two, and I want to add one more thing about Scott. Uh, When you talk about how people um, hold you at high regard, Dan Infault talks very highly about Scott Buckley. Scott is one of Dan's favorite guys to talk to about deer. So Scott is on my list at number two, and um, on my list at number one is a guy that I just kind of recently dug into I knew that he was someone that I wanted to talk about on this podcast, but it's someone that I knew nothing about. I just knew that he was an absolute killer and I knew he did it all over the country. And his name's Jeremy Aaron. Jeremy Aaron is a guy he's on YouTube, do it yourself hunter. And um, maybe he's disqualified because in 2003, he had a show on the outdoor channel. It just costed him way too much money to do it. But he was one of the first guys that was out there trying to film killing deer on public ground and just listen to this resume. Um, First of all, he's from Mississippi and he's from a place where people hunt deer with dogs. 
And for him to hunt these deer, I mean, a deer that's constantly being chased around by a dog is going to be hard to kill. I asked him for kind of like a resume and I said, Hey, um, I need some context. Like how many deer do you think you've killed? And he paused and laughed. And he said, you, you Northern boys don't know us Southern boys. And <laughs> I said, can you give me a number? He said, I honestly can't. He's like, I, I don't know. It's too many. And so that right there, I was like, Oh my God, but he's in a state in Mississippi. They have like unlimited tags so they could kill a ton of deer. So I wanted to know, okay, like, what have you done outside of that? He's hunted with a, um, he's hunted big game animals in 21 states. He's hunted whitetails in 12 and is killed in 10. And those states are Colorado, Oklahoma, Kansas, South Dakota, Iowa, Missouri, Arkansas, Wisconsin, Illinois, Indiana, and Mississippi. That's 11. So he, uh, he's a Southern guy. He is killing deer everywhere he goes. He's 54 years old. He's self-employed. Um, and he is like, because of what I just said, put him at number one on my list. I don't know, um, the caliber, but I know those are all big deer. He's not killing small, small bucks when he goes out of state. Um, but 12, bow hunted in 12 states killed in 10. So he's only had two unsuccessful, uh, states. So yeah, that Jeremy Aaron, do it yourself hunter on YouTube. His goal is to educate people. Um, he does it in a very good way. He's super entertaining to listen to. Um, so yeah, that's, that's my list. Yeah. It's funny. I, I actually came across his probably about the same time you did. If it's been about six months, like I just was on YouTube looking around at stuff. And I think I, I came across his channel and started watching. He has a younger guy, if I'm not mistaken, that does a fair amount of filming too. And that dude's a killer. Yep. That, that's part of like his, his crew or whatever, but yeah. Um, actually I thought about putting it on my, him on my larger list. Um, I just didn't, to your point, I just don't know enough about him like to, to, to put him on my list. It's like, it'd be unfair to, you know, the other folks on my list to kind of slot him in it. Cause I literally had none of the stats that you had. I spoke with him on the phone 20 minutes, 20 minutes before we recorded. And if I wouldn't have spoke to him, I, he wouldn't have been on my list cause I wouldn't have had anything to back up. Right. Why uh, real right. quick. I want to, um, my, um, honorable mention, so to speak, Ryan Glitzky, a guy mm -hmm. that um, he's killing deer everywhere he goes. Tanner DeShong, this kid is um, Whitetail Adrenaline's next it factor. He's filming for Whitetail Adrenaline. He has had a year that is yeah. just oh, yeah. unspeakable. And yeah. like next year, he's not going to be able to be on the list of unknown guys because he's about to blow up. Right. So Tanner DeShong, a guy from Pennsylvania, again, um, absolute killer. And a guy that Chad and I talked about, like, does he make the list? I don't know. He's an absolute killer. Mike Rex, he's a guy from Ohio that has the most Ohio book bucks, Ohio big buck. That's a 140 minimum. And he really? has, yeah, that's a 140 minimum. Him and his sons, uh, him and his two boys have 49. Not, not counting this year because they all killed slammers this year too. Mike killed a, 246 inch deer on public on public ground good so, lord yeah so mike rex is a guy that because he's only doing it in ohio is on my honorable mention but if you want to see uh, an absolute killer he's also a what previous white tail curbs guest so that guy is on my i was gonna say i thought i remembered watching that episode yeah yeah and between like cameron's list and my list you know i had scott buckley on my list i had johnny stewart on my list i had justin wright so a lot of again like just a little bit of crossover there. Can't didn't want to steal all the glory or whatever, you know. I didn't want to take all Cameron's talking points, but um, yeah, there's a couple of people on that list. Uh, Jeremy Aaron, no idea yeah. who it was until last week. Um, so there was, you know, Tanner, um, some good good stuff there. So as we kind of work through all of this, let's kind of go into a discussion of compiling. Like, oh, this is where it gets nitty gritty. Yeah. The five guys, like be between the four of us, uh, you know, right. who well, we should just say we should just get the five we can all agree on in no specific order first. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and then we could rank them, right? Like one through five, because I think because we do have some crossover, which I think probably like three of the spots are probably going to be pretty easy to kind of fill fill in. I think two of them are going to be really hard because we've got 
we've got some variety in our lists. I wrote down everyone's top five. So um, I'll just read. I didn't list Chad's because Chad didn't give an order. But um, Clint's list was Todd Mead, Troy Pottinger, Nathan Killen, Jesse Coots, Travis Keith. Aaron's list, Troy Pottinger, Jake Bush, Nathan Killen, Greg Litzinger, Brent Todd. My list was Tyrell Roy, Johnny Stewart, Justin Wright, Scott Buckley, Jeremy Aaron. Chad? So if I were, again, to compile those five to one, five would be uh, Mike Perry. Four would be Johnny Stewart. Three would be Scott Buckley. Two would be Jason Michael. And then one would be Jesse Coots. Okay, so we have some crossover with Troy Pottinger was number one on Aaron's, number two on Clint's. Mm -hmm. Nathan Killen was number three on both of your guys' honorable mention on Chad's. Um, Jesse Coots was number four on Clint's list, number one on Chad's. Scott Buckley was number two on mine, number three on uh, Chad's. Uh, Mike Perry was honorable mention on yours. Johnny Stewart was four on mine. Johnny Stewart was four on Chad's. Let me uh, interject here real quick. So to make this really objective, I guess, let's just put a point system based on each individual That's, five lists. So number one, if you're not, if you come in on number one on anybody's list, you get five points. Yep. Two would be four points. Three would be three. Four would be two. Five is one. And we'll just go through there and compile um, a composite number or a sum or what total, whatever. And that'll be pretty objective of saying, all right, these five guys. Mm -hmm. Okay. We got the, we got the list compiled. So, and we'll work from number one to number five. Okay. Uh, number one is going to be Troy Pottinger, nine points. So he has a number one slot, uh, number two slot. So, just tally him in. Number one, Troy Pottinger. We have a <laughs> split decision on number two. So this will be slot two and slot three. We'll do a PRCA rules. Like there's no. Um, coming in with seven points, Jesse Coots. So we have him at a number one, and we also have him at a number four. So number two slash three, Jesse Coots, and then Scott Buckley coming in at three, and then also a four, seven points. Now, this is where it starts to get interesting because we have a bunch of people um, with four and five points. So this is for the number four slot. We have Todd Mead, number one, five points on Clint's list. We also have Jared Aaron, Cameron's list, number one, five points. And, oh, I'm sorry. Number, I screwed this up too, Clint. Don't feel bad. <laughs> <laughs> Nathan Killens actually, Nathan Killens actually has six points. So he slotted in on two lists at number three, which would give him six points. So he has solidified that number, that number four spot. Right. Number five slash six would then be uh, Todd Mead and, and Jeremy Aaron with five points. So, so really, there's only a battle over number five. Yeah, two and three, and then yeah, the the number five we got to give uh, got to slot two people in there. But then you have guys, Greg Litz, two points, Mike Perry, uh, one point, Johnny, um, Stewart. Johnny Stewart's on there twice, twice with four points. Um, Jason Michaels on there with four points. Jake Bush on there with four points. I mean, there's just, it's tough. I mean, <laughs> you might as well do the NFL 100 every year, you know, <laughs> like, <laughs> well, I think, cool. <laughs> I think the most fair way to do it there is to kind of do, do what we did, which is kind of rank them where they were at on, on each person's list. But I think the good part is, is that we did a whole podcast about it to where we're not saying that the guys that didn't make the list aren't killers. We're just saying that when we right. put the rank, you know, the ranking together and we just look at how we each individually rank. Cause we each, even though we had a criteria, we each value different things differently, you know? And so it's cause when you, as soon as you said, Jason Michaels, I was like, Oh, that's his name. You know, like, 
if I would have thought of him yesterday and would have thought of his name, he probably would have been two or three on my list. You know what yeah. I mean? Like potentially, you know, cause that dude's just a straight killer. So I think it's just cool that we're able to kind of do a show like this and give all these guys some love, you know, and, and recognition for, you know, all the hard work that they put in and not that they're looking for it. Cause that we talked about that too. Like they're not looking for the recognition, but too bad guys, you got it. Yeah. And then Jeremy Aaron, I forgot all about him. Like, honestly, I didn't even know his name. I've watched his YouTube stuff and just really didn't really click. That, that's a good call there, Cameron. Yeah. He's a guy that um, you like, you talk to, we all talk to deer hunters every day. Like the positions that we're in with where we're at in our careers, we talk to deer hunters every day. And when Jeremy talks about why he's hunting where and the moves that he's making, I instantly say, this guy knows what he's doing. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of people on YouTube and a lot of people that you talk to and a lot of people that we've done whitetail cribs with and not taking anything away from their resumes, but you might be on a really good piece of property. You might be in a state that you can bait and you just kill deer over bait every year. There's a guy and I'm going to call him out, but he has the most impressive whitetail resume that we have ever done a whitetail cribs episode with. And his name is James Reed. He had 70 Pope and young bucks. Holy cow. 70 Pope and young deer. And these were like, like 40 over 160 or something. Yeah. It was like, sure. there was, he had three 200s. He had a couple in the 190s, 180s. Like you could go down and list what he's oh, doing. Crap. But when we were talking to him at this White Tail Cribs episode, we were asking him how he's doing. And he said, I dump corn piles out. And when I get pictures of them on my cell cameras, I go kill them with a crossbow. Mm. Every deer that he's killed. So it's like, yeah, that guy has a crazy impressive wall. But you're like, okay. Could you go do that in Pennsylvania where you can't bait? So it's not, a, like, it's, not a, it's not a transferable skill. Right. So like there's guys that are killing a bunch of big deer and then there's killers and there's a difference between the two of those people. And Jeremy Aaron's a guy that was, as soon as I talked, as soon as I heard him talk, I said, he knows what he's doing. Yeah. There's a couple guys local to me that uh, they'll tag out on Pope and Young's every year uh, here but will not go out of state and they won't tell you, but I know why it's because they're comfortable here. They have what they have here. And if they go out there, their image will be tarnished when they don't kill a deer the first trip. But the, the first ones, when you come back from a Kansas public land hunt and you kill 120 inch deer, it's, they're the first ones to say, why'd you kill that deer out there? <laughs> you know, and it's like, Okay, why are we even involved with each other? <laughs> you know, right. it's not the goal here. <laughs> so, right. <clears throat> well, um, we appreciate you guys uh, doing this with us. This was a fun way to kind of kind of break this down. Like I said, when you try to lump all this stuff into a ten minute video and then provide context of how how you built the list or why those guys are included, like you're just barely scratching the surface. Right. And then, uh, you know, I don't think we really did justice to the other piece of content that we did. So we wanted to do this in a longer, longer form format and have discussions with, you know, well-respected people in the industry, like your, like yourselves that um, have had, had the opportunity to really talk to a wide variety of people uh, across the board. So it was, uh, it was a lot of fun having you guys on and listening to your perspectives and opinions and how you kind of formulated, um, formulated your guys's list. Yeah. I appreciate you having us. Yeah, appreciate you having me on, and uh, I'm sure I'll take some heat for the Eddie Claypool over Andy May thing. So go ahead and uh, send that to uh, Chad Sylvester at Exodus Outdoor Gear. Hey, 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 hey. <laughs> and, and Greg uh, Lutzinger. <laughs> yeah, I'm just gonna say, Greg, I love you. 